I started a band just after high school, which failed probably immediately, like two <laughs> weeks in. I just, I was like, oh, this is way more work than I want to put in, but I've been punching people my whole life, so I'll just go ahead and rock with that. You just blame the promoter. Uh, but yeah. Blame, blame your band manager on that, you know? Oh, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I was the band manager. Oh, yeah, yeah. you got to blame the band manager then. <laughs> yeah. No, no I, it was I, totally, totally that guy's fault, whoever that was. It just, Sorry, did I, you, I did you say I your band name? I guys I was done. I just dipped. What was your band name? We didn't. Uh, oh, wait, no, we did. T- I think it was uh, it, it was something kind of lame, like chains and whips or whatever. Yeah. We kind of the whole sexy vibe behind it. Oh, that's what awesome. What kind of music? It was very heavy metal, like right. guttural, the stuff that like you Meg- probably listen like to. Like Megadeth? Like child listens to. That's about it. Like Megadeth? Yeah, it's just pretty fair, like Megadeth. All right, all Megadeth's right. way cooler than us. <laughs> <laughs> Were you ever in a band? M- me? Yeah. No. I was in a band called Waistband Tuck. Where's that Waistband come? Tuck? Yeah, when like... Uh, oh, that makes sense for yeah. you. Yeah. That does make sense. Oh, uh, yeah. You know what I'm talking about when you're like in elementary school? You guys know what I'm talking about. No, I, I didn't wear sweats to school like you did. <laughs> yeah. No. Uh, you got a fight coming up, don't you? Yeah, um, a couple days, three days now. Woo! Friday. What's that look like for you for your uh, like pre-fight um, prep? Um, a lot of just a lot of consuming water, a lot of consuming very low calorie food or very little food at all. Um, lots of nerves. I'm a, I'm a wreck. Like the the day of the fight, every time it just is so. I build up that anxiety, but mainly it's just trying to make the weight. The next few days, I'm off. I'm going to go swimming, relax, hopefully not think about it all too much. And then when fight comes, I'll meet the weight and we'll step in there. He'll punch me. I'll punch him. It'll be a fantastic day. <laughs> Is it the type of thing where you feel nervous and then the bell rings and then you get going and then, it, and then you, and it's, it's, you just like the nerves go away and you just you rely on everything you practice? Is that how it feels like for you? Oh, yeah. hundred a hundred percent it whatever you don't practice or train in to be second nature is not going to happen in the fight and the moment i don't i wouldn't say like the bell goes off but the moment the first punch is thrown your feelings subside a lot of it just comes from the fact you're in an audience you're performing for people and so that whole stage fright thing can come into play it could be a new environment there's lots of lights on you but once you guys hit each other it goes back to that kind of primal we're in the gym we're just trying to beat each other up and see who comes out on top vibe and so it's a much easier way to relax at that point what's like your uh your prep for trying to make weight like how much are you trying to lose before weigh-ins i if i was being a good boy i would have only had to lose like 15 pounds but i got injured back in february and i just decided cake was now my best friend (laughs) And so I started putting on all the pounds. I think I was 205 in my highest, and I had to get down to 70 for this fight Dang. in like a month and a half. Mm. So I went pretty hard. I was drinking two gallons of water a day. I was mainly raw vegetable. I had some protein here and there. I did went vegan for a period of time. And now as we get to the end, I'm just going to be slowly cutting back on everything, period. So probably night before or day of the weigh-ins, this Wednesday night and Thursday, not going to have anything. Probably very <laughs> little to no water, no food. And uh, walk in there, not half dead, but just really, really irritable. <laughs> very, very hangry. <laughs> Get the weigh-ins done. Go have lunch, and it'll be a, it'll be a relaxing day after that. But it was re- this particular one was hard. Normally, got a few months out, I can just kind of ease up on the diet. Not as much sweets, a lot more activity, same amount of water, and I'll get down the weight pretty easy. But because I decided that I was going to be 30 pounds heavier than I needed to be, I had to put in the extra work. And then how much time do you have between weigh-ins and like uh, to refuel? Thankfully, this time, I got a whole day. Oh, I got nice. over a day, actually. Yeah, some events will do same-day weigh-ins where you go in the morning, get your weight done, and then you have the afternoon to recoup before the fight in the evening. This one's day before weigh-ins. So I'll go in Thursday, get the weight done, have a little bit of a ceremony where they you know, videotape us staring at each other like we want to kiss angrily, and then we're going to go – have lunch and relax and the next day in the afternoon we come back to hit each other how legit is that 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 way in when everyone's kind of looking looking uh angrily at each other is there a lot of kind of fugazi about that or are, are you genuinely 
uh, as mad as everyone looks. Oh, no, I, I like my opponent. He's a good guy, actually. <laughs> I imagine we'd be pretty good friends outside of this event. <laughs> okay. Um, it, the, way, the way I've been told was you can do it to hype the fight. You can, you can, obviously, people like seeing some hostility, kind of like being the heel back in the WWE days where yeah. you're just kind of a dick to everyone. People like watching you get beat up or maybe you guys have, have beef for whatever reason and people want to see that drama unplay in the cage. But, yeah, I, I smile at my opponents. I'll chit-chat with them right in the middles or stand there looking at each other or we'll fist bump or high-five. And when you go to fight, you just you turn that off for the next however many minutes you're fighting. Sometimes it's nine if you're in the lower levels, as high as 15 or 25 in the upper levels. You just turn that off for a little bit. And when the fight's over, you go back to being buddies if you want. But some guys do hate each other. Some guys genuinely <laughs> uh, have actual animosity towards one another, and it shows when they fight. But especially in my position now, no, I think a lot of my guys have just been really cool, to be honest. Do you think you would fight better or worse if you came into a fight with animosity? Like, you know, you'd have that anger, but it might make you do things that you normally wouldn't do, you know, and put you in situations you normally wouldn't just because you want to punish that other person so bad that you're not smart about it, you know? Yeah, yeah. It, the way I would think about it is you kind of want to be a little bit aggressive and hostile. You don't have to loathe your opponent, but you should be more than happy to inflict as much damage as possible on them. If they've already done something to piss you off, that's probably going to be okay as long as you don't lose yourself in that kind of raw emotion because you don't want to make those mistakes. You don't want to look at them and just start going ham because they pissed you off. You want to still remain relatively smart about what you're doing. But I think... If I was to fight completely angry, just balls to the wall, and I'm trying to slaughter this guy in any way possible, I'd probably get tagged or hit a lot more than I would like to be. Because it's going to make you dumb. I'm just At that point, I'm only care about hitting him and not yeah. keeping myself uh, safe during that fight. Are you, uh, you more of a striker or are you, you more of, you know, what's kind of your specialty? Oh, I, I punch people for sure. It's so much easier. <laughs> I... I Wrestling has dominated the sport for the last decade, and I'm so tired of it. I, I, I hate going to the ground. It's my least favorite thing in the world to do. I'd much rather stand up and have this guy punch me in the face than ever deal with him on the ground. I don't care if he sucks on the ground. Just hit me. I don't even want to test those waters. I just want to stay on my feet and be comfy. What, um, uh, what happened so. to, I mean, when I remember MMA getting started, it was like Ken Shamrock, and you know, you'd only mm. see it on pay-per-views. Uh, Ah, Randleman was that? Uh, God, who's the guy with that white hair, white, big, big, huge black dude? Kevin Randleman? No, I met him. But anyways, now it seems like they have a UFC, a you know, big, huge event uh, a couple times a year. So many more people mm. are into it. I mean, what do what do you think? Um, like, made it so popular? It's just I think it's more or less evolved through the time. As it became more widely accepted, you know, way back when there were several states back in 93, 94, 95 that were just completely banning all MMA events. I would read articles of these kids who were like, oh, I got to go to underground smokers if I want to get started and hopefully get to the UFC or get to these other labels that are kind of doing it in the states. But as time went on and it became more widely accepted, started making its pay-per-view debuts, it started getting on uh, social media platforms when those became popular back in the mid-early 2000s. It got a lot more comforting, or people got more comfortable with it. And so it began to grow. More people joined MMA who maybe never would have. More companies saw the financial value behind these fights like they did boxing. And a lot of the initial pushback was just because it's too violent. That's what it always comes down to. Same reason bare knuckle boxing was not a sport, or at least a legal sport for the longest time, because it's too violent. It potential risk of harm to the body, or the viewership may not appreciate seeing all the blood and the gore. Uh, so they didn't want to put it on. And once it started happening more often, they got funding, for instance, from the Gracie Jiu-Jitsu family. And they got funding from them to continue hosting these events early on. It just kind of excited people who were looking for that next big thing. Boxing was great for a while. Kickboxing had been around for a while. And now here's the next level of competition people can strive to be a part of. And that's what really helped the sport grow. You said you've been punching people your whole life. and. Yeah. One of your things in your bio said, you know, early on in your childhood, you lost your dad. And that, mm -hmm. uh, I guess, contributed to maybe you're just 
lashing out, right? It was kind of your way to cope with that loss at an early age, maybe? You just had a lot of anger, a lot of frustration. Was that, was that accurate? Yeah, it was, it was coupled because my dad passed, and then I had the whole family unit that was his side of the family. But when he passed, they all left. So I just really didn't know how to deal with that as a kid. And actually, even before I got into martial arts, I was punching people because I decided to go around and start getting in fights in school because that was a great way for me to handle it. And I remember being a little child pretending to be an airplane. And when a kid got too close to my wings, I would just run them straight <laughs> into their face. And hopefully I didn't get caught, which of course I did because it's kind of a big way to get attention. Yeah. And so I get in school, out of school suspension. They were close to trying to expel me. And so my mom's like, this is crazy, and just chucked me into the nearest martial arts class she could find. And uh, thankfully, it all worked out from there. I started getting beat up by people who were way better than me, and I decided this is a bad idea to be you know, screwing around with people who I don't know what they can do. Uh, we were, we were talking, me, we were talking about that. get through a lot of the pain and whatnot. We were talking about that before we came on the air about how careful, I was saying, I'm careful when I go out in public and get in – and you put yourself in any bad situation, you just don't know what the capabilities of anybody else is that you might get into beef with, you know, because there's a lot of people out there that, you know, are very dangerous with just their two fists or, you know, whatever their martial art background is. And you think that you're just going to brawl with a guy and you might get yourself into something you, you wish you hadn't. And that's one thing, you know, going back to the beginning of, when UFC started coming around and on TV, it's, it's like that, that certainly changes the way I, uh, especially you're out in public. It's like, well, you may not be as tough as you think you are and you better be careful on who you pick a fight with because there's a lot of people out there that, that have some skills. Yeah. You know, Faraz Zahabi was on the Joe Rogan podcast a, a while ago and they had this good conversation about understanding what violence is and how it can impact people's lives on a daily basis. And when you compete and you fight and you experience it regularly, be it in a karate class or a wrestling class, you experience what another human being could do to you when they are simply better at you in combat. It changes your mindset. You may walk in thinking you're the biggest, baddest street fighter in your neighborhood. You know, you're, you're five and zero against those preschoolers down the road, <laughs> but you walk into an MMA gym and you get, are we, can we cuss on here or no? Sure, go for it. Okay. And you get your shit rocked by a guy who's 50 pounds lighter than you, but has been doing this for the last five years of his life. You learn very fast, oh, maybe I can't just start picking on people because I perceive how they look, and I think they're an easy target. Uh, for God's sakes, what was that story of the guy who was uh, harassing Mike Tyson, that drunk guy on the airplane? Oh, yeah. oh man. He, he, thought for, he thought for whatever reason that Mike Tyson may be old or maybe he's got more skills or maybe he's deserving of Mike Tyson's time and he can't be ignored. Uh, well, he got the kind of attention he, no one in their life ever wants. Fact. So it really teaches you when you get into a situation where you do martial arts or you do some kind of com competitive combat where you're like, ah, my body's not really as tough as I'd like it to be or what I'd imagine myself being. And maybe I'm just taking on these guys who aren't really as tough as me, but I could hit up the wrong person one day and that could be the end. I could be lights out. I can be in a breathing through a tube for the rest of my life. So it makes you, I don't think it should frighten people, but it certainly makes you think twice before you do something stupid. Yeah. Even if you, you do have a little bit of, uh, of background, you take that same physical interaction that you would be on the mats for, and you bring it into a uh, a bar or outside on the concrete. That is a completely different situation. No rules. There's well, not only are there no rules, but like getting your face smushed into a plush uh, wrestling mat as opposed to uh, gravel, a curb, a curb, right? Yeah. Like those are and. The consequences are just like so grave. Uh, I was a bar, uh, a bouncer. I know me. Um, for uh, hey, you for look tough. No, no, I'm not. Rather doughy and soft. But <laughs> uh, luckily, you know, first of all, you always have an advantage because everyone's drunk and you're sober, and you just outnumber people, right? Like I luckily, uh, my good friend Ben was on here. He's six, seven, three hundred pounds. Like. You know he's gonna he's gonna handle some business, but you would see these you know drunk people fighting each other, and it's just there's no there's no skill, there's no tact. It's just I'm gonna very throw, sloppy. Yeah, I'm gonna throw haymakers. Yeah, but if you catch somebody correctly, you could I mean theoretically end their life. I I still remember to this day 
uh, I was in college and it was, you know, last calls over, everybody, bars are clearing out and then here come all the tough guys that are drunk and big old crowd and two guys are going at it. And then you think that it's you and this other guy and somebody comes up just out of the crowd and sucker punches this guy from behind. He's out, hits the ground. I mean, you know, fractured jaw, yeah. everything like it's, that's, you, I mean, it's just, uh, it's something you don't even consider, right? You're thinking what we talked about earlier is like, I'm careful who I mess with because you don't know what they're capable of. Well, you might be sizing up this one guy, and this is it's going to be me and you, and then somebody else pulls a punch. You, you have no chance of defending. And, I mean, his injuries were bad. But I still I can still see that punch to this day, and that was one of the reasons, too. It's like, man, just, you're in a crowd. You don't know what can happen. Yeah. You just have – there are no rules, man. 